really helps us to visualize what we actually are doing so the reality of actually what's going on what we are actually achieving what our pace is um so if we run a few sprints and we measure what we're completing and what we're getting done then we can get an idea of what our capacity is and how much work that we can complete and then we can feed that back in um, and so when we're sprint planning we can make sure that we're only bringing across as much work as we can actually achieve um, it's really interesting um, if you look at some of the research um, that they'll show that actually if we do push our teams, if we if we do kind of push them to 100% planning in 100% of their time or sometimes even more 120%, um, what that does is it does give us this kind of very high performance, but it's not a sustainable high performance. So it's high performance, but only for a very short period of time. So what we see is it's much better to build this sustainable pace um, and actually over a longer period of time, then that will maximize our performance because actually that high rate of performance can't be sustained for very long at all. Um, and when we look at things like uh, factory lines and manufacturing, actually, when we look at what's going through their, their factories, through that, sort of that, that, that manufacturing chain, actually the optimum capacity is often only around 60-70%. We can't fill something to maximum capacity because then it becomes, it slows it down, it becomes clunky, we get more blocks and barriers. So actually it can feel quite counterintuitive, but actually planning our, our, our sprints up to just 60-70% can often really help to maximise our performance and get more get more done and also reduce the amount of time that we need to take planning um, and give us some slack within um, our sprint that helps us to um, build and rework if we need to um, do those extra things that we hadn't thought about but also um, perhaps accommodate some additional work high priority work that comes in during the sprint as well so giving us some slack for that unplanned work um, now um, the the impact of overburdening teams as well is, is quite extreme um i talked to a scrum master many years ago and i found it really interesting um because he said that the culture where he worked he worked for quite a big high um enterprise um tech organization um and he ran a uh, scrum team and he said that we always always plan our team's capacity to at least 100 percent um we must always be seen to be aiming for this 100 percent productivity um and i would be in real trouble if i started trying to um plan only 60 70 percent of my team sprint um and i felt real really sorry for his team in that moment um because um, if you're if you're planning like 120 percent you're actually putting yourself into this kind of perpetual failure you can't win so every sprint you're not going to complete the work that you needed to get done done you're not going to deliver what you needed to and therefore you're going to feel fairly crap about that um whereas actually if we spin that and we we you know we plan our capacity and yes we only plan in 70 percent but actually, if we get, you know, towards the end of our sprint and we realise that we've we've still got capacity and we've got some room, then actually we can do more. We can refine. We can um, we can do some of those change and improvement things that we've been working on. We can do some team building. We can use the time to estimate, engage with our clients um, and really build. So, so not just doing the day job, but actually changing, and improving and, 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 and making better what we do already. Um, and we do need that slack, and especially when we're working in complex environments. So often um, teams I work with, you know, there's an element of we know what we're doing and we know how we're going to do things. But actually, there's quite a big element of we haven't done this before. You know, we know it's theoretically possible, but we haven't actually done it before. Or, you know, we, we, we've got a clear um, we've got a clear know how about how we're going to do things but it's not really been agreed completely yet so what we're doing hasn't been completely agreed um so we have this degree of complexity within our projects which make it really hard to accurately estimate as well um, so having that slack just gives us that chance to to be um able to respond if a task is is bigger than we anticipated to be able to feed that back in as well um, and we can use that slack um 
as well and and give us that 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 time to learn and experiment um i i think um you know one of the really key things as well is often what we see is teams 100 percent plan their work and they don't allow for the unplanned work through the sprint um so you might be running a quite close sprint you know no changes in that two three week period uh, but actually the majority of teams that I work with, they cannot lock down a sprint for that long. You know, at some point during the sprint, there is going to be something urgent and important that pops up that they need to deal with. So how do we deal with that? How do we balance that, um, that planned work and what we've committed to and what we know we can achieve with that unplanned work, those ad hoc tasks, but also our change and improvement projects as well. So we can think of this as kind of a balance that we've got to keep between running, doing the day job, getting our work done, but then changing and improving and adjusting as well. Um, so Agile can really help us to see what our flow is, get an idea of what our capacity is, help us to balance those ratios of work. So the different types of work, we might have different types of work that we're doing. Um, I find it really interesting to just for a few weeks map ad hoc tasks with a team. So often these are small tasks. They don't, you know, they don't require logging, but you, they do quite a lot of them. So I just get them to keep track of that just for a sprint just so we've got an idea of how much of their sprint is being taken up by these um, the, the small little tasks that aren't being recorded anywhere, because often that can be um, a stressor on the team is that, that that time isn't being taken into account. And, you know, we might not have to record it all the time, but we should be conscious. So by recording it for a short period, we can become conscious of how much of that work we'll have. So that then when we're doing our sprint, we can say, actually, you know, we're aware that on average, we're getting around, you know, four hours of this every sprint. Therefore, we need to um, just chunk out four hours to, to, to accommodate for that. Um, so it's really important, really helping us to get that kind of better rhythm and, and also adjust our ratio as well within our sprint planning so that we can um, we can really respond to things. Um, I think one of the key things that often um, teams ask me is around um, what do you do if you've got a client or um, I often think a, a enthusiastic sales director that um, keeps coming into the team and going, guys, guys, I've got a great new idea. Can you drop everything, do this, you know, and then literally a couple of days later, he's back saying um, or she is back saying, um, you know, guys, guys, I've, I, I, you know, I've won this new client, I promised them something in a fortnight, drop everything, do this. Um, and being able to respond to that, you know, because there is a balance, obviously, you know, we need to bring business in, um, but we also need to manage how we're delivering that business and how we're connected um, as a team through sales and marketing through to delivery and production and, and, and post-production. So, I mean, if we take this scenario, um, I've got an Agile sprint board here. So we've got a little scenario here. If you've watched the Canvas video, then you'll recognize this. Um, so the Canvas is really simple. We've got our backlog here and we've got our sprint here. And um, we've also got an inbox for managing inbound inquiries. So in this scenario, um, we're starting the week. We've planned in our sprint of work. We've just got a 40 hour week here. So we're just seeing our, our sprint as a, as a week. Um, and so we planned in 30 hours of work, which has left us 10 hours of slack. Um, and during our sprint, so um, we have potentially we've started our sprint. So perhaps we've, we've started on this task and those two new tasks came in. Um, so we've decided that this one was a important and urgent and we'd fit it into this sprint. And this one wasn't this one wasn't important or urgent and therefore would, would go into the backlog for future consideration. Now, we might very well progress with this sprint quite nicely um, and we can carry on. But if we do have that scenario, so this drops into our inbox and we've got a client is absolutely adamant that we get this job done um, this sprint, that what we can do is we can go, okay, and we can actually share with them our plan. And so it's really important that the client's got some visibility, even at a very high level of, of, um, of planning of what is actually getting done um, each sprint. So what we're aiming to achieve. So what we can then do is we can say, okay, well, if we do this task this sprint, then what are we going to stop doing? 
Um, because um, I have to say, we're not a Mary Poppins bag. You can't just keep piling work on us as a team and we can't magically get it done. So, um, I mean, one obvious thing is, have we got more resource that we could put to this? So could, could we put another um, another person on this? Have we got somebody who's got half a week free, 20 hours free that could pick this up, in which case we might be able to accommodate it. But more often than not, that's not going to be um, a, 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 an option. Um, so we, we need to kind of go back to the client at this point and kind of say, OK, well, we've planned already 36 points of this sprint, um, leaving us with only four points of work. So we are 16 points short if we want to do your wouldn't it be lovely complex activity there. Um, so what would you like us to stop doing? OK, so in this scenario, we've got to find 14, uh, is it 16 points? So um, will stop doing this 16 must do complex tasks well they're probably not going to want to do that um or we can stop doing pretty much everything else can't we so we could stop doing these things these things could go back shift back to the backlog and then we'd be okay again we're still within our our 40 points um of work but we're not going to get that must do urgent important thing done and we're not going to get this must do simple or this could do um, simple task either so that's probably not going to be agreeable either so what we need to do is we do need to say what do we need to stop doing or you know push this back um, into the backlog now if we're taking an agile approach I think there is a solution to this so if we do have a client that's shouting for this um, I think what we need to be conscious of initially is that it is a wouldn't it be lovely if um, and it is quite complex. Um, so we probably don't know exactly what the client wants and we don't know how we're actually going to deliver that yet. So we have got four points left in our sprint now. So um, what I would generally, I think, do in this scenario is say, OK, look, we've got four points left. How about we split this task down? So how about we take four hours and we look into this in more detail so we'll we'll do that's quite simple we'll build something quite simple that we can understand um, and it will be a bit of a kind of minimum viable product to even so we might draft something out or scope something out or sketch something out for them um, so then that we can achieve this sprint so we'll get this done this sprint and then we'll revisit this um, at the end of the sprint so we'll revisit this and we'll kind of go back and say okay so this might actually be 16 or it might not it might stay a 20 um but we can contribute those those four points now if we are on a limit with a client as well in terms of they've already picked their their amount of capacity and resource they fix that then obviously we need to have conversations about the fact that um that there are potentially uh, 26 points here above what we have actually agreed within our scope so um, what we might need to do is say okay we might need to stop doing 26 points from this backlog so you know this one that is probably way bigger than a 26 we could probably buy perhaps we refine that and we know that this is now a 50 and um, that they could say okay let's park that for a minute um, because we can't fit that in so and then that would give us a little bit more slack to, to add in some other new bits and pieces um, likewise we could look to do a minimum viable product here as well um, so we could look to do a smaller version just to get some better understanding of it um, before we commit any more time and resources so this really helps in terms of as we're going through the sprint if we are having a flexible sprint helping us to manage that capacity um, and be flexible and agile at the same time. Um, ideally, we do want to limit the amount of work that, that is changed or added on to our sprint. Um, so, um, you know, if we are running a closed sprint and um, we're finding that things are going over, so that even if we've got a closed sprint and we've planned all our work in, that actually we get to the end of the sprint and we've not got stuff done. Um, perhaps we need to look at re-estimating. So we need to come back and say, actually, you know, everything's taking about, you know, a third longer than we estimated. So we need to go into our backlog and we need to add a third to all of these. So, you know, 12 becomes 16. 
um, eight we'll, we'll make that 10 you know so and and this will be done through conversation with the team so we'll do some estimation games and with that better understanding that we we can certainly you know perhaps re-estimate some of these musts and shoulds that we understand quite well and simple ones that we understand quite well um, but we might find that um that they, and again that might mean that we have to reprioritize and rescape out what we're actually able to deliver um or simplify some of these things down even further so um you know one of the one of the key things we can often see is over engineering so we're creating actually more than the client needs so uh, by getting that early feedback on that early product and, and getting that work in progress out to them we can understand better what level of quality what level of detail that they want um, and adjust ourselves for that so adjust that which might mean that we can bring our estimates down slightly and deliver more for less and um, so i think there are certainly um lots of ways that we can look at that we can help to improve that that kind of um sustainable pace and really help to maximize that and, and get that sustainable pace and get that flow within within the team um and really using um as well not just throughout our sprint and during our sprint planning but making sure that when we get to that review and reflect at the end of our sprint and we're running our retrospectives and our sprint review that we are looking at process and content. So we're looking at agile or, or our process, our methodologies, our tools, our approaches um, and, and our process. So we're reflecting on that, but we're also reflecting on the work that we've delivered, our work rate, our performance, and what value we've delivered to the client. Um, and then, you know, our capabilities and our capacities, do we have the capacity? Was that good? Um, did it feel overwhelming um, or did it feel okay did it feel like a sustainable pace i think that's a good question to ask the team and um, do we need that do we have the capabilities is there capabilities or resources or other things that we need in order to to speed up to be able to do things faster or better um, we talked about revisiting those estimates and those priorities and making sure that we're feeding that back in so when we know how long things are taking because often when we start a project you know it's not clear what we're doing how we're going to do things our estimates are um vague sometimes um or if we're using t-shirt sizes you know we've got a range we've got an idea of how long it takes but not accurate um so as we get to know the project better get into the workflow we can start to predict better how long things are going to take because we understand them better and we've done something similar perhaps um, again, that bringing up that kind of over-engineering, have we got clarity over what the client actually wants to deliver? Are we over-engineering? Are we getting lots of scope creep and change requests? So being conscious of those things so that we can feed that back in and really make sure that it's not affecting um, our ability to maintain that sustainable pace. Um, and I talk about not just kind of performance, but also growth and well-being of our team. So growth in terms of our ability to, to grow our skills and our knowledge and our abilities to be more product, productive, to refine things and to develop things more, but also our well-being as a team as well. So not putting our teams under that extreme stress, not put, make, put them in a position where they're feeling overwhelmed and they don't know where to turn next. Um, and making things so complex that we can't plan them in easily. You know, planning becomes a real um, big chunk if we're actually trying to plan 100% into um, a fixed space of time. So um, I hope to think about those uh, the, the kind of cube puzzles that you get. They've got lots of different shapes um, in them. I got one at a, a team day many, many years ago. Um, and um, it, it took ages. Once I'd taken them out, it took ages to get them back in, all back into that square, 100% of them in there. Um, but what I did find is if you just kind of take one piece out or two pieces out, you can get them in there in about 30 seconds. So um, it's a real kind of that final piece of the jigsaw is often really, really difficult. So if we take away that final piece of the jigsaw, if we're only planning 60, 70%, then actually it makes it far easier for our teams to plan in their week. 
And if we take that pressure off, then actually people are free to be more creative, to get the job done. Um, and certainly I know I'm more productive in a good mood than I am in a bad mood. So um, I think it is a really important aspect around building that sustainable pace to build, to, to, to sustain the well-being of our teams as well. Um, and to make sure that they are um, that they are doing well and um, and and happy in what they do. So um, I think I've said all I need, all I all I would like to say. Um, I think you know agile really helps us to um, find that rate, find that rhythm. Um, and really help us to get visibility of work so we can understand in reality what's going on because often we're referring to plans and plans are um, you know our best guess at how long things are going to take and they're done very early so um, you know getting that visibility of reality getting that ability to manage and measure our progress and see what we're getting done is really really useful um, plus we can see those blocks and impediments those things that are holding us back um, we can plan for the unplanned um, and we can really start to understand um, and also relay that to our partners, our stakeholders, our clients as well. So I think it's always, you know, far easier to show somebody something than it is to tell them something. So that board example, it was much easier once it was presented that way in terms of like um, cards that you need to swap out and a maximum number to achieve that actually it made it much simpler and easier for the client to understand that. Um, I often use a, a kind of house building method, me, uh, metaphor in the sense that if you're if you're a builder building a house like my, my dad um, that um, you know you can see the progress so as a client you can kind of look on site and you can see the progress you can see the walls going up you can see the roof going on the windows going in the kitchen going up um, you know the garage going in all these different things and you can see that progress so often with knowledge-based teams that I work with, there isn't that tangible thing that you can see. Um, so what Agile really, really does help to do is make that more tangible. So if you imagine those cards on your board are the bricks in your house, that actually we can really start to, you know, show our client what's involved and show them the progress. And um, and and I I do use the the example of you know, and if our client decides, you know, halfway through the project that they want a conservatory, um, then you know, if we were building a house and that was a a scenario, you know, you totally obviously expect to pay extra for that conservatory. But again, in knowledge based work, clients do tend to assume that they can have extra. For nothing so we need to educate them and make sure that we're showing them that actually you know if you want that conservatory then I'm afraid you're going to have to have a cheaper kitchen or you know we won't build the garage but you've got to make that decision early because otherwise we'll have started building the garage and then that won't be an option anymore but if we're taking that agile approach we can swap things in and out so you know if if we again think of those cards as those options for that house is actually they can pick a mix and they can look at swapping things out and they can do that throughout the cycle um, and they can add to their budget and time if they want to they can um, adjust things as they wish and really we are then you know delivering based on value for them but also taking into account our own um, resources and our own capacity and what we are actually able to deliver to them. So that's um, building a sustainable pace to maximise performance, well-being and um, growth with your teams. I hope you found it useful. I think it is um, a really good principle, one of the really good agile principles um, and really is one to come back to and revisit and look at whether, you know, we are doing that, whether we have got a sustainable pace um, and what we can do to improve that. So what we can do to kind of right size that pace. Um, so it's it's not always about doing less or doing more, um, but also getting that right sense of pace. And, and that can change as well. So given different periods, different times of year and different trends within the business, that we can see that those things need to be adjusted slightly as we go. So I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please do give it a like so that I know. Um, and do please subscribe if you'd like to keep track of um, what future posts and videos um, and if you'd like to talk more about your team and building a sustainable pace um, then please do get in touch with me take care bye bye